Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 659 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 4th of December 2022 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Dan Padavona about how he pivoted genres to find more sales success as an author. Plus, he gives lots of mindset tips about how you can sort out your creative life and achieve your goals. It's an inspiring conversation and will definitely be useful if you want to make more money from your books in 2023. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, well, Chris Rush has a great series right now on the year in review. And she has an article about traditional publishing, uh, which came out last week. And remember, Chris and her husband, Dean Wesley Smith, were in traditional publishing for decades. So they have seen it all. And it is a pretty long article. It's really interesting, kind of looking at how things have changed this year. Definitely go read it in more detail. Links in the show notes. Uh, But Chris has an interesting quote from the trial between the Department of Justice in the US and Penguin Random House. And it's Hachette Book Group CEO, Michael Peach or Piech, not sure how you say that. Uh, But he said, I do not consider self-publishing a threat at all because self-published authors can't pay themselves an advance against royalties. And Chris quotes that, and she's always very straight talking as Chris. And she says, who gives a rat's flying behind about an advance when you can make money every month on your publications? And many, 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 many writers make more than enough to sustain a good upper middle class living. And I wanted to further comment on this because this is actually what I hear all the time from traditionally published authors who don't understand the business model of the indie author. So no, we don't get advances. And yes, we have to invest in editing and cover design at least. But if we take the business seriously and we build up a backlist, we make income every month, predictably on time in our bank accounts. Or in fact, even every day if you sell direct as I do. And I've been doing this since September 2011 when I left my day job. Or at least I've been, uh, when I started selling books was 2008. So I've been receiving money since 2008. Now, that's pretty much every month for more than a decade I have been paid for my books. And not just from one place or one publisher. So I get lots of deposits in my bank account from Amazon. And there are multiple payments by country store from country. Hobo, Apple, Draft a Digital, Publish Drive, Find Away, Audible, Ingram Spark, Foreign Rights Licensing, which is usually every quarter. And then, of course, from Selling Direct, if you buy from me at creativepenbooks.com, then I get that money almost immediately, like within, uh, depending on which payment method. Uh, but essentially, it's it means that indie authors can manage cash flow and we're in control of when the money comes. And this is, it's a a huge mindset shift. And I think Dan talks about mindset in today's interview, but the mindset shift of a business model is a hard thing to consider. I realise that for those people who, or even if you're used to a salary, um, if you're used to having one company who kind of provide all your income, it can be hard to shift to a multiple streams of income approach. But this is, it's kind of the magic of creating intellectual property assets. But you can manage your cash flow, you know how much is coming in, what day it will come in. Um, I also know that I can do a promotion and I can generate more cash flow. And that's what I'm going to do right now. (laughs) Yes, we are only a few weeks away from the end of 2022. So I am doing a end of year promotion. You can get 33% off my ebooks and audiobooks, fiction and nonfiction, and also 33% off my courses until the end of the year. So uh, that's ebooks and audiobooks and courses. So all digital products, not print, because of course, print is a bit of a pain. (laughs) 
Uh, but you can use coupon 2022-2022 on creativepenbooks.com for ebooks and audiobooks and on creative thecreativepen.com forward slash learn for my courses. Use coupon 2022 and that is obviously valid until the end of the year. So I will put the links in the show notes. But um, this is an example of being able to drive revenue when you own and control your own intellectual property. So back to the Department of Justice trial, I will be commenting more about that. And in fact, discussing this with Jane Friedman in two weeks time, uh, we talk about a lot more to do with that trial. So that's all exciting. uh, But the biggest news from last week as I record this has been the release of ChatGPT from OpenAI, which is, quite frankly, the generative writing tool I have been waiting for probably since 2016 when uh, Lisa Dole was beaten by AlphaGo. And I've been talking about AI. You guys who've been around for a long time know how long I've been talking about this. But ChatGPT, which you can find at chat.openai.com, This is, it just feels like the beginning of the proper tools for writers. So many of you have been playing with Midjourney, Stable Diffusion and Dolly to create images from your text. And now some of you have also been using PseudoWrite and Jarvis and others to do text, to do marketing text, to do all kinds of writing. But ChatGPT takes this to another level and it is free right now. Um, So definitely, and you have no excuse not to try this. For a start, it's free. And secondly, it's a really simple interface. It's just a a text box. So you can, and I'm going to give you some examples in a minute so you know what to do with it. (laughs) But there are two things that make it amazing and kind of a change from a lot of this other stuff. It has essentially like a memory. So it makes it far more possible to create long form content. And the chat interface makes it much more intuitive for us to use. So please, please, please try it out uh, because it will be useful for your day job as well as your creative work, your books, whether you write fiction, nonfiction, poetry, whatever you do. Uh, I told my patrons about it as soon as it came out and they have been uh, amazed. Um, Will said, wow, I just tried a novel description test and I'm blown away. And one email uh, from uh, one of my patrons said, AI has been freaking me out for a while. There are certainly elements I'm not at all thrilled about. And I know many of you feel that way. There are always pros and cons with technology. But this person said, however, I took chat GPT for a spin and I can absolutely see real possibilities for this technology. Taglines, blurbs, outlines. The output I got definitely gave me new things to work with and some very straightforward organisational ideas. Thought you might like to know that after some time of you extolling the potential virtues of AI, I think it's going to come in handy. So I wanted to share that um, because I know many of you feel that way. You're like, oh, no, she's talking about AI again. (laughs) But this time it really is awesome. So I have spent many hours. And in fact, this has been filling my dreams. I've been waking up in the middle of the night with ideas about this. It's like it's put my imagination on steroids. It has completely transformed my plans for 2023. I can finally see how I can ideate faster, create faster, the things that are in my head. And for many of us, we're out of control with ideas. (laughs) And what stops us is the ability to create faster. So just a few examples of what you could try. And I'll give you some fiction and some nonfiction. So first of all, it is chat.openai.com, links in the show notes. So it can generate sales descriptions from an overview. For example, type, and I use please and thank you because I welcome our <laughs> AI overlords. You don't have to use please and thank you, but you'll find when you do it, you're, you, you kind of want to be polite. Well, at least I do. I'm English, <laughs> British. <laughs> so let's try an example. Use type, So you type in the little prompt box. Please write a book sales description about a vampire archaeologist who must seek out an ancient relic in order to save her people from destruction in the style of Lara Croft. And then you hit return and it will generate a sales description. So you can just write exactly mine if you want to give it a try or something of your own ideas. Then there's a little button that says try again. Or you can say things like, um, please write that more like a fantasy epic and it will rewrite it. 
you could say actually change the vampire archaeologist to a mermaid archaeologist or to a human archaeologist or whatever you want. But you can you can carry on. And when I say it has memory, what it means is your your the chat keeps going uh, in the same you're in the same kind of chat. So it will look at what you've written previously and apply it to your next question. So then what you can say, so let's say you really like the sales description and you can say, uh, oh, well, first of all, you can use it to rewrite your own sales descriptions. And I think this is going to be so useful for authors because basically you can, so so the prompt is, please rewrite this book sales description to make it more like a best-selling thriller novel and then paste in your book sales description. Obviously, I like thriller. Perhaps you need fantasy. Perhaps you need self-help. Whatever. It will generate a book sales description. You can then say, for example, turn this into a story outline. You could say, please generate a 25-chapter story outline for the vampire archaeologist story. Or you could say, please write a scene where the vampire archaeologist confronts her father about a family scene secret. So you can essentially keep expanding and expanding on these things. Or you could say, um, based on your fictional knowledge about vampires and archaeology, what are some of the things that the vampire archaeologist could look for? Or you could say, uh, this is set in a post-apocalyptic world, based on your knowledge. And sometimes you have to phrase things in the right way, or it might just say, I don't know anything about that that's where I say things like, based on your knowledge of myth and fantasy novels, what are the things, what are the clan sigils that this vampire archaeologist might wear on their cloak or something like that? So anyway, that's uh, some fictional ideas for you to start with. Now, the same with nonfiction. So, (laughs) and this seriously blew my mind. And You know, when you get a tool and you think, oh, I wish I had had this before. I just it would have changed my life. This is how I feel about this. Uh, And for someone who's a discovery writer and I've never written an outline before, this is kind of it might completely change my writing process. (laughs) Ah, you can tell I'm very, very giddy and excited about it. But with nonfiction, for example, you could say, please write a sales description about a nonfiction book that will help fathers communicate better with their sons. And then you could say, okay, I like that. Please expand that into 20 chapter headings and then it will expand it. And then you could say, take chapter one. What are five bullet points that I should include in that chapter? Now, you may not use all these things exactly because that's not how we ideate or how we create. But what it does is it will give you a ton of things you have not thought of. Um, so I did this with my shadow book and the ideas that it gave me are things I now want to write about. So you can just use this as almost like a co-writing partner. Now, Jonathan has been in there every day as well. So it can write and debug code. And he's been showing it to some, you know, coding friends and they're like, whoa, because it also explains the code. Or you can say, please debug this and tell me what the problem is. And it will do that. It can rewrite emails. So Jonathan, for example, needed to write this email. He wrote it in his own style. And then he said, please make this email more succinct. And it was able to essentially make his email much better. There was a great example on Twitter of someone who uh, was not very good at writing, um, as in they were a landscape gardener or something. And maybe they had dyslexia or I can't remember what it was, but they essentially struggled with writing and um, they're using these tools to essentially turn very basic email with very bad spelling into a professional looking email that will help this person actually gain work. So there are practical applications. There are um, a lot of teachers are obviously saying, well, this is we're over because, of course, this doesn't plagiarize. Um, And yes, I'll come to ethics in a minute. But essentially, on the exciting side, I spent several hours ideating, like literally, I couldn't stop using this. It was so much fun. I was just sitting here giggling away, like Mid Journey as well, with images. In fact, I went back and forwards with Mid Journey and uh, Chat GPT, kind of making up these characters in this entirely new world. And I started from nowhere. I actually started with that mermaid archaeologist prompt because I was just playing around and then I just expand I've basically got an outline for kind of an epic fantasy series <laughs> set like oh anyway I'm not going to tell you because I'm so excited about it but it's not what I'd planned to get into but it's giving me so many ideas now my Clifton strengths include input and learner and intellection and I've had a real dry patch with fiction the last couple of years because my 
my fiction ideas always came from my travels and that just things have really changed in that in that sense and so what this has given me it's almost like it's become an input learner intellection ideation co-pilot whatever and it's lit up all these centers in my brain and I feel like it feels like I'm my brain is almost exploding with more ideas and that is a very very fun feeling my two-year-old creative self is delighted by this so give it a try while it's free and while it's still in beta chat.openai.com now uh, of course Oh, oh, and also I should mention Andrew Main, who has been on the show and is an award-winning, traditionally published author, has an article about using this for fiction, which I'll link in the show notes. So you can use the words in your own writing. Their terms and conditions say you need to declare it, which is what I have always advocated anyway. And in fact, uh, I have an AI statement of usage in the back of my novels. And the Alliance of Independent Authors has ethical guidelines for AI for authors. So I'll link all of those in the show notes. Um, if you have my AI assisted author course, which again, you can get 33% off by using 2022, uh, I go into much more detail on some of the problems and challenges of AI. And again, the most important thing is curation, understanding that you need to edit it, you need to um, not just use it word for word. There are things, you know, you should, uh, we always edit. I mean, this is first draft, this is ideas. And then, yeah, there are some uh, there's a court case at the moment saying, well, all of these models have been trained on work either in copyright or with uh, Creative Commons licenses and all of this. I know, understand this this court case, but there is absolutely no way that this stuff is going back in the box. And if US companies or UK companies or EU companies decide that there needs to be some recompense, then maybe there'll be some recompense, but it will not stop this happening and if yeah I and it, it, please try it this time I know many of you have not wanted to try the tools because you're worried about it but if you try it you're going to find that you <laughs> you might change your mind so please let me know what you think in the comments of the show notes you can also email me joanna at the creative pen.com you can tweet me at the creative pen and if you're on twitter uh, which has just been exploding search hash chat gpt for loads of amazing examples of what people are creating with this tool it is the mid journey for text i really think that and as ever i am energized and excited not worried about it i am I'm thrilled seriously you can tell <laughs> right so that is at chat.openai.com so in my personal update pilgrimage is with my editor and I have started planning for the kickstarter which will be the end of January hopefully by which time I will have finished the ebook I will have narrated the audiobook and I'm working with my book designer to create a special print edition with ex extra color pages foil other things it will be numbered so I am only going to sell this special hardback print edition for this Kickstarter. I might obviously buy a few extra for me that I might sell at events or something, but this will be a numbered special edition limited run. And uh, I will do a normal print on demand paperback. Absolutely. I might even do a print on demand hardback edition, but this special print edition will only be on the Kickstarter. So I'm starting to plan for that. And again, I know I've said I, I didn't want to do a Kickstarter, but I feel like this is the only way I can do this project. And also I last, you know, earlier this year, I say last year, <laughs> in the summer of 2022, when I was doing how to write a novel, I was also building my Shopify store and I really couldn't manage Kickstarter and Shopify build and the release of how to write a novel. So uh, I am going to do this this time and I'm going to do it in quite a... Um, not it won't be overly ambitious I think I also scared myself last time because I I thought I needed to do like a really really successful kickstarter but I'm going to have quite a low um low number that I need to achieve because I feel like this is almost a test uh, so hopefully enough of you will buy my pilgrimage book that I will be able to at least do the special print run uh, also I've even before ChatGPT emerged, I've been wanting to write a story again. And my mid-journey character portraits, which I've put on my 
Facebook and my Instagram at JF Penn Author have been giving me loads of ideas. And so I'm just having so much fun. And like I said, it's almost completely changed my plan for 2023. I was thinking of doing a whole load of other stuff. And now I'm like, do you know what? I am really going to try and write a lot of fiction next year, plus the shadow book. Uh, definitely, I also want to put out a book on the creator economy. I might also do the AI assisted author as a book, but basically, I feel like my creativity is on steroids, which is very exciting because I have had two years of of not great <laughs> creativity. So also, uh, my what is likely to be my last interview on books and travel is out now. I might do some ad hoc things in the future, but I am quitting my books and travel podcast. So I mentioned the book Quit by Annie Duke a few weeks back, recommended by my friend Jay Thorne. And I also talked about it with Orna Ross on the Ask Ally podcast last week. And I realised I needed to get over the sunk cost thing and quit the podcast. Things were very different when I started it in 2019. And of course, the world has changed. Travel has changed. I learned a lot and I love the show. But yeah, I need more room for creating the books I want to create. And you guys know podcasting takes a lot of work. And I had a business plan for that books and travel brand, but it it went with the pandemic, to be honest. And it helped me during the difficult times. But yeah, it is done. And the interview with Emily Thomas, who is a philosopher, it's on the meaning of travel. And it felt like a really good final episode. Now I will do another episode next year when I launch Pilgrimage. But um, yeah, I need the t- I need the space, I need the time to do all the things I want to do next year. So the site booksandtravel.page will stay live and I will probably just blog there occasionally and what I mean by that is here's some pictures of Gloucester Cathedral where I was yesterday um but yeah if you haven't read Quit by Annie Duke yet definitely put it on your list for holiday reading and hopefully before the end of the year because it's a very powerful book and when you're thinking about what you want to achieve in 2023 a lot of the time we need to get rid of things so we have space to create the things we want to create so yeah check out more discussion on this on the um, Ask Ally podcast. Right, so thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Uh, Tiffany Dix Dickinson sent me a picture walking pugs Bridget and Misha while I listen to the John Truby episode, blown away by the interview on the podcast. And lovely picture of pugs in the autumn leaves. Nikki Morrock, who has the Peep podcast, said, Great interview. I just bought John Truby's book because I listened while cooking dinner and realised I need those recipes for better genre writing. And a picture of air fried crab wontons looks yummy. And then finally, RJ Pearson (laughs) sent me this crazy picture of a red sky in the distance um, and said, how to keep focused on your writing when you can see Mauna Loa uh, erupting from your front yard. That's in Hawaii where there's been some eruptions. Um, Count the dwindling days to your hard deadline to your editor. And yeah, the picture was amazing. So yes, uh, please tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening, email me joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices and I use Findaway Voices for all my audio. I love it. You can find a narrator or you can upload files yourself. It um, publishes to 42 or it might even be 43 now different audiobook publishers and yeah, uh, it, uh, one of them being Chirp, where you can do promotions and book bub ads and that kind of thing. I love Findaway Voices. I'm a super fan and I will play one of their ads in a minute. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time and all the extra stuff is sponsored by my patrons. Uh, thanks to new patrons this week. Noreen Stone, Brendan Miggins, Liam Rooney, Jenny DeWitt, Henry Stradford, Ted Russ, Sharif Faisullah and Lee Cole or Leah Cole. Really appreciate your support and thanks to everyone who continues to support the show. And um, I know I read out all the names of people who join. There are also a lot of people who leave every week, every month. So um, 
Obviously, I'm not going to read out everyone who leaves, but I really appreciate those people who come in and out. You, If you do support the show on Patreon, you don't have to do it every month. You can come in and go out again. And if you do support the show, you get the extra Q&A. You get to ask me questions and I record these extra Q&A shows around 45 minutes of me answering your questions. Um, and also, like I said, I, I share extra stuff. So I shared some stuff on the uh, chat GPT when that came out. And uh, yeah, so if you would like to support the show, just a couple of dollars or pounds or whatever euros, <laughs> you can get the extra Q&A audio and the backlist. So just go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. So I'll play a word from Find Away Voices and then we'll get on with the interview. He's listening. She's listening. They're all searching for their next listen. Is your audiobook out there? If not, what's holding you back? After this, it won't be audiobook creation tools. Introducing Findaway Voices Marketplace, the audiobook creation platform built for a world booming with audiobooks. Voices Marketplace gives you a searchable and trusted space to connect with narrators, free production and business tools, and the power to bring your audiobooks to market quickly. We've heard everything you have asked and used that to build an audiobook creation platform for you. Plus, we give you access to the world's largest audiobook distribution network, reaching listeners through more than 40 retail and library partners. No exclusivity. You keep your rights. This is your audiobook creation platform. Ready to get started? Make it on Marketplace. Dan Padovona is the best-selling and award-nominated author of thrillers and mysteries, including the Wolf Lake thrillers and Logan and Scarlet serial killer thrillers. So welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you so much, Joanna. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you. But before we get into it, tell us a little bit more about you and how you got into writing and self-publishing. Well, writing came to me very late in life. I did some writing as a child I wrote uh, a few short stories during high school, which ended up getting published in in the school newspaper, but it interested me back then, but I didn't really follow through on it. Now, I do have a communications degree, which is somewhat angling towards that direction, but I ended up going into atmospheric sciences and meteorology eventually, and I think I became a writer because I love reading. It was probably a late 2000s. 2013, early 2014, I read a a fictional book, which absolutely blew me away. And I just knew right then and there, I needed to create something like this. Not that I could ever create something quite that brilliant, but I got about to writing and I read everything that I could on the subject of writing. And I began as a horror author in 2014, switched to thrillers in 2018. And that's pretty much where things took off for me. So we'll circle back on that. But you said you came to writing very late in life. I didn't think you were very old, actually. (laughs) Can you give us a sense of what time of your life? I still get proofed uh, if I buy wine, but I am actually 54 now. And I started writing 2014. So that would have made me 46 at the time. Okay. And then, like you said, things took off in 2018. So you were 50. And I think that's really great because so many people are like, oh, have I missed a chance to become a writer? And my mum wrote her first book at 72. So I don't think there's like, there's no need to think if people listening, like it's never too late, right? And so you were in meteorology. That's like a weatherman. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I did that uh, since 1994. I retired in September of 2021. So there was 27 years of that. And yeah, I, I loved the job and I loved the people. Uh, the shift work was killing me and it had really for 27 years. And that's what made my decision for me to make a move. Otherwise, I think I would still be doing it. Mm-hmm. I was just so blessed by writing and the way my, my career took off that I was making many times my income that I was working at my day job. So it was kind of like, well, I could do this for four hours a day and make a lot, or I could do that for eight or nine hours a day and make a little. So, you know, easy choice. Oh, it is. And we're going to dig into all of that. But you said you started out writing horror. And I think that's where I must have first seen you because I think you did you co-write something with Jay Thorne? I did. Yeah. Like everyone has. Clearly I have. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's right. He's like the Kevin Bacon of of writing. I he think. is. And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, there may be eight degrees of separation when it comes to to Jay, to Jay Thorne, and he, he's been a good friend ever since too. Uh, he pretty much is to everybody in the industry. Oh, absolutely. Um, but so you started out writing horror. So sure. why did you decide to pivot into mysteries and thrillers? Like I, I love reading horror, and I write a little bit of horror and mysteries and thrillers. It's it, it is a much more mainstream niche. But kind of talk us through why you decided to make that change. Well, it was two different reasons, I think. The first was financial. It, I just wasn't making money at writing horror. And I I felt that the genre itself had very voracious fans who read it, but there aren't that many of them. And they're shrinking too, which I just find mind-boggling because I grew up loving horror. And when I was a kid, you couldn't swing a, a cat without hitting a Friday the 13th or Halloween movie. And that's what dominated Hollywood. And these days, or just seems to be kind of taking a back burner. And I'm not sure why that is. But it wasn't purely for financial reasons, though. I, I, I hit a point, too, in my life where I think I'd become a more positive person. And I was writing some really dark horror. And putting myself in those places day after day was one of the reasons why I had procrastinated about writing. I just couldn't bring myself to do it every day and I needed a change. Now that doesn't change what I read. I still read plenty of horror. I'm a huge Jack Ketchum fan. Um, I love Stephen King, Dean Koontz, obviously. He was probably more thriller than horror anyway, but I still love those types of books. But writing them to me eventually became a little bit suffocating. Mm. Craft wise, so you said there that the horror readership is shrinking. I wonder if it's because what people used to call horror is now moved into all kinds of other genres. So, for example, it used to be anything with a vampire in was horror. And now you could say it's urban fantasy or dark yeah. fantasy. So I almost feel yeah. like horror just the word it used to cover so much and now there's so many granular subgenres that are not in horror but yet they really are what horror used to be yeah i think that that is an excellent point and it has become a lot more fragmented there in, in vampires you brought up vampires that's probably the ultimate example the first book i ever wrote was a book called storberry which was horribly titled and probably was the reason nobody ever found it <laughs> but it was essentially a love letter to stephen king's salem's lot i wanted to return to the old school vampire horror that you know i found just absolutely wonderful growing up with and was haunting and get it away from Twilight and all those other directions that vampire movies and TV shows were heading in. There's nothing wrong with Twilight or Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but I just felt that there was no Salem's Lot anymore. There, there were no frightening vampires. And that's why I wanted to head in that direction. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, many people listening will be like, oh, I don't write horror, but they're actually writing some kind of but like post-apocalyptic we both know Zach Bahamnan as well that again that's kind of horror but post-apoc is its own thing so I think it, there's so many subgenres. but then it's interesting so you said you're a positive person and writing all that dark stuff was difficult but you've got serial killer thrillers and they're some of your best sellers <laughs> and it's so funny because I love reading horror but I struggle reading serial killers I find them more disturbing than reading horror so how did you identify serial killers and how on earth is it not as dark as your other stuff? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably going to be a multifaceted answer to that one. You know, so to start with, you know, serial killers, I think are more frightening for most people because, well, all right, I'm not going to say that vampires don't exist. Some people do believe that they exist. I don't, but serial killers most definitely exist. And one could be living next door to you. That That's a very pro frightening prospect. As far as how did I happen upon them, I love Thomas Harris. I love all the Hannibal books and movies. To me, it's not just the horror, which is part of that, but it's also the hunt. It's also the mystery that, that, that surrounds it. So when I was trying to decide, well, what am I going to write? You know, in 2017, 2018, I was actually really close to just stopping writing at all. Is writing is so difficult. And it, it takes up all your time and all your mental energy. And if you're not seeing any results from that, 
as far as great reviews, money, whatever, then it's hard to summon um, the strength to do it every day. So I, I wanted to try something else. And I kind of looked at writing and success as like separate Venn diagrams. So you had like in one circle, you would have a list of things that, that you love to either read or write. And for me, that was fantasy, horror, some psychological thriller type stuff. Um, and then you had the stuff which actually sells in the other uh, circle. And the overlap to me, you know, it, I, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before, but was obviously dark thrillers and sometimes serial killer thrillers. And that to me just seemed like, oh, this is perfect. These books are very popular. So then I went about reading what was out there, what was being published by indies and selling very well, just to see, can I write in this genre? And would I enjoy it? And the first two series, which I read, I mean, I just like devoured them. I was enjoying them so much. And I was like, yeah, I can do this. And not only can I do this, I would love to do this. So yeah, I jumped on that immediately. And, and to, to probably wrap it all up with a bow, I also incorporate into my stories the positivity that I talked about too. So like the wolf-like thrillers, on the surface are very dark mysteries, often with serial killers in the background. Right now I'm writing one about a serial kidnapper who, who kills. And it's very dark from that standpoint. But below the surface, every Wolf Lake thriller is actually about overcoming adversity, the powers of, of love and friendship, and understanding each other. And these themes like pervade that entire series. And it just makes writing these characters such a joy and putting in them into situations. Uh, if you love Dean Koontz, Dean Koontz has such a great knack for ending every single book, making you feel so good and so positive about the future, optimistic. And that's something which I really wanted to do too. And even in my Logan and Scarlet thrillers, which are also very dark serial killer thrillers, they often end on a very positive note. Not every time, but certainly with the wolf-like thrillers, they do. You mentioned Dean Coots there. I love his Jane Hawke series. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. And it's so funny. I do find his work a bit hit or miss with me, as in sometimes I love the books and sometimes I couldn't care less, really. And it's so interesting, but he's so prolific. <laughs> Yeah, like it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But I want to stay on the craft elements because Blake Crouch did this too. Did you mm -hmm. take some inspiration from Blake Crouch in that he was known in the horror genre? And then I believe he was like, I'm going to write thrillers and I'm going to make this a success. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if the element is the supernatural. And this is something I think about a lot because all my fiction has is supernatural in some way. And yet it seems like here in the UK, the crime genre is huge. But and I wrote some crime books, but I just couldn't help putting some supernatural in. And then it suddenly falls off the edge of what is acceptable to the mass market in that genre. So given that you wrote horror and vampires and stuff, have you got any supernatural in what you write now? And is that something you've deliberately left out? There isn't just because most of them are like police procedurals and whatnot. There are some people who are definitely making it work. Like, like L.T. Ryan incorporates a, a lot of supernatural in, into his books. And they're pretty much either psychological or serial killer thrillers. It kind of falls fall somewhere in there. He's made it work. For me, I've tried to stick to the... Yeah, that could happen, elements of the stories. And for whatever reason, it's resonated very well with, with my readers, and I don't want to mess that up. There are times where I feel very limited because Supernatural is, is not a part of what I write, and I would love to be able to incorporate it. In fact, I hinted at it in, in the book that I'm writing right now where it ends up just being a tease. There isn't actually any ghosts in the story, but for a while there, you're really wondering if there are. So yeah, it, it's something I would love to incorporate if I could find a way to do it properly. And it may just be something where I would do a separate series and see what the reaction is. 
Mm, yeah. And you mentioned your readers there. So how's it gone with you? Ha- you're using the same name, right? So mm-hmm. you, you went from publishing horror to suddenly publishing the serial killers and thrillers and things. So how did that go? Like, have you had feedback saying, hey, Dan, why aren't you writing this other type of book anymore? <laughs> and have people crossed over or do you think you found an entirely new audience? Found an entirely new audience. I'll take you a little bit about how that went down. Now, first of all, I if I had it to do over again and I could go back, I would create a pen name for my thriller titles mm. and just to better separate things. Because I do think that there is some confusion within the Amazon algorithm as to what exactly does he write here? But I think now that I sell so many more books than thrillers than I do horror, that it probably isn't much of a problem anymore. But back in 2018, again, when I made the shift and I started writing these books called the Scarlet Bell Thrillers, and I released the first book for 99 cents, and I had this great plan, which was lined out. I was going to hold the the first three books until they were all ready, and then I was going to rapid release them once every two to three weeks, I think it was. And it just seemed like foolproof plan. It was working really great for the people on like the 20 books forums. And when I tried this, it completely fell flat. I sent it out to my list and I got no sales. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I just sent these thrillers out to like three or 400 people who love horror. So why would they buy the book? Mm. So yeah, obviously I confused them and I, I wasn't doing myself any favors, So I started to try to find another way into locating readers. I had never had success with Facebook ads in the past, but I decided, well, I'll give it a shot. And I quickly discovered that by getting read through, through the three books in my series, I was getting enough money and enough clicks or enough orders off my clicks that I was actually turning a small profit on these Facebook ads. So then I started to think, well, there's more books coming in this series. I'm only up to three and there's going to be 10. So this really has potential. So I just kept writing and I kept those ads running. I knew that the ads eventually would probably start to fail. And they did. Facebook ads, usually two two to four months, they start to get a little bit wonky and you got to create something new. But in that amount of time, I was able to attract enough people to my Facebook page, attract enough people to sign up to to my mailing list. And I started an absolutely new mailing list too. I switched to MailerLite and just made a clean break with the new signups. And I quickly had a list which was larger than my horror list. And it had only taken me a couple months to do it. And these people were not just like on a list, they were buying the books. So that was a big change too. And that just, it, I think it became like a snowball at that point. Every, every new series I released brought more and more new readers into my world. And it greatly grew my Facebook following, my Instagram and Twitter, but especially the, the email list. And that's where the rubber really hits the road, I think, in writing. Yeah, I think it's it's so interesting. So you've done some great blog posts. I'm going to link to them in the show notes. And one of your blog posts says, between 2019 and 2022, I grew my earnings from break even to over $350,000, which is amazing. And I guess that's when you decided to leave your job. So how did you make that decision? Because obviously there are up years, there are down years and things are difficult. So how did you make that decision? Because I know some authors want to do that, some authors don't. So yeah, how did you make that? Well, that was a really tough choice. Uh, But fortunately, the earnings grew so quickly that it became an easy choice at the very end. I had often joked with my wife if, if my writing ever earned us enough money that it replaced my income at work, I would leave. Ha ha. <laughs> and neither of us ever thought that that would happen. And then things really took off. And by late 2020, early 2021, I had replaced my income. But at that point, I felt as, as you did, as you just elucidated, that it, there are ups and downs and you can fail. So I felt at that point that just replacing my income, well, that was a wonderful blessing, was not a safety net for me. 
I need to make twice my income. And then we would really think about it. And so I talked to my wife about it. And then we get, again, we said, if I ever made 2x my income, ha ha. And then that happened several months later. And that's where we both decided, yeah, I think it's time because it was, I was really burning the candle at both ends. I'm, I'm working nine hours a day. There's another mm, 45 minutes probably in my day of commuting. And then I've got to get in an hour and a half of writing on, in my free time. And then there's editing. It was just, it was getting crazy. I was keeping up with it, but there was, I felt no reason to have to keep up with it anymore. And by the time that I put in my notice of leaving, my income had then grown to three times what I was making at work. So it became such an easy decision. And actually at the end, I was like, boy, I wish I had taken a date, which was earlier than this, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. It's good to be cautious. I mean, let's talk about marketing. So you've mentioned Facebook ads and that you got into that. So tell us about what kind of marketing you're doing now, because it, it, Facebook ads have changed a lot in the last couple of years. I mean, even since you left in what 2021, this is only a year later, but we've had the Apple privacy changes and some people are saying ads don't work anymore. Amazon ads have got more expensive. So how are you running things at the moment? Ads have definitely got more expensive. I, I believe that it's more it, it less to do with Apple and it's more to do with people simply realizing, authors simply realizing that there's money to be made here and everybody's kind of piling in and it's, it's just a supply and demand thing. It's driving up clicks. So it's a lot more difficult to make a return on investment these days than it was, say, two years ago when it was a killing I was making on, on these investments. So Facebook ads to me, I can't make, for instance, mailing list signups through a Facebook ads work financially for me anymore. I find that doing multi-author promos is far more cost efficient and at least it keeps me in the black. So I've gotten away from those altogether. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll turn them on for a little bit just to see if I can build my list again at a profit, but I, I really can't. So that that's already gone away for me. Writing in a long series and having all that extra read through is such an advantage. And it allows me to have a lot more wiggle room on cost per click. So the idea being that if you have one book that you're selling for $4.99, even if you're making a 70% commission on that, the odds that you're going to turn a profit on that with, with an AMS ad or a Facebook ad are pretty much slim and none. However, if you have nine more books backing that up in the series and your read-through is pretty good, you're actually making a lot more than 70% of $4.99. You're making 70% of all those sales. Plus, if you're part of Kindle Unlimited, you're making that on page reads as well and selling some paperbacks. So to me, it became a lot more easy to break away from the pack. And there are some words which I can, phrases anyway, that I can bid on in, in AMS for ridiculous amounts, like 2 to $4 per click. Oh, and I'm not actually paying that much per click. I usually end up paying about like 75 to a buck 25 per click but I'm dominating like the top position and I'm always getting those clicks whenever I want them. And I can afford to do so because I know that every time I get a, a click or a buy, I'm going to make so much more money than I would if it was just one book. I'm selling an entire series. So that's really important too. But I do agree it's getting more and more difficult to make money that way. And I think you always need to think outside the box. As you coined the term author entrepreneurs, we need to think not like every other author in the genre. And we need to take a, a larger view of things and just think like marketers. So I read a lot of books on marketing, period. And there's always a trick that, that is, is out there which other authors aren't doing. So as long as you keep standing on the shoulders of giants, you're only going to get as tall as, as they allow you to get. But if you are innovating and you're borrowing techniques which work in other industries, then like, for instance, attracting people to your website. Most people have websites which are just there to show their about author page and have some buy links. If you can actually attract people who are looking for your types of books to your website, 
then you completely bypass the need for ads. You don't have to pay for anything. It's just work. You need to do some due diligence and writing articles and whatnot. But if you're a writer, that should be pretty easy to, to switch to. Mm. It's in, I mean, obviously, I've built this business on uh, for non, the nonfiction side on content marketing, and I have pretty much have never advertise the creative pen and certainly not the podcast. So I've built a business on on that, but it takes a lot longer for sure. And it was funny as you were talking there, I read a lot of business books and marketing books too. And I was just thinking like, where's the blue water right now? And <laughs> as we record this, Elon Musk recently bought Twitter and a whole load of people are leaving Twitter and going on to this thing called Mastodon. Now I haven't looked at this, but I was just thinking, I bet you there's some marketing possibilities on Mastodon, whatever <laughs> the hell, or it might just go the way of the dinosaurs, which is what I thought as soon as I heard the name. <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I also have seen people pouring back into LinkedIn. LinkedIn, which I mean, it's not really a fiction platform, but it's not always the same, same thing, isn't it? As as you said, I did want to ask you, you had another, you have another great blog post about revitalizing a series with Facebook ads. And I think this is so important. When is it worth spending money on an old series or when should we just write another series? And I guess a sub question is, would you ever use these tactics back on your horror books or are you have you just left them behind? So it wouldn't work on the horror books anymore for the, basically the same reasons it didn't, didn't work on my horror books three, three to five years ago. And that is that I was writing standalones. I just cannot come up with a way to sell those standalones at a profit. I couldn't find a way to do it back then because cost per click had gone up by so much. Now the, the cost per clicks are dwarfing what they were just even a few years ago. There's just absolutely no chance. Now I do run some AMS ads like evergreen ads that, you know, target the usual, the Dean Koontz's, the Jack Ketchum's, Stephen King's. And yeah, sure. I'll get maybe a sale here, a sale there, but it's not enough to move the needle. And I just kind of do it because I know that they'll make money over time, even if it's just a few bucks a month. There's no reason not to do them, but they're not worth spending time or mental energy on. If I had written series back then, I probably could have pull, pulled it off. The only thing which comes close is my Dark Vanishing series, which is post-apocalyptic. And I have had some success running Facebook ads to those and making that work. I'm a little bit less success for whatever reason with AMS ads. I think because with AMS ads, it's so much more granular and I haven't zeroed in on exactly who I should be targeting, but I've tried for about three or four years to, to zero in on who that should be. And I still haven't found it yet. Mm. And then let's just take AMS ads. Do you target traditionally published authors like I don't know, someone like Karen Slaughter, for example, has some, I believe, some serial killer books. But do you target traditionally published authors or only indies? Oh, sure. I've targeted not only through AMS, but Facebook ads. I've targeted Karen Slaughter in the past. And I've also targeted Lisa Gardner, who I, I seem to mm. do better with for whatever reason. That seems to be a better match, at least in in my readers' opinions. Dean Koontz was a great target for me through Facebook ads for about four months until the ads started to dry up. Ads are really weird in that it's based on the audience size that that writer has. And for whatever reason, according to Facebook anyway, Dean Koontz only has like 200,000 people reading him, which is about what they say, I think, for Lisa Gardner too, whereas some other readers who are much, or writers who are much smaller than him may have millions and so I don't really get it. I don't understand what the algorithm is considering a Dean Koontz reader, but either way, it's not nearly tapping all the readers, which he has. So that's why I think Facebook ads for Dean Koontz worked well for me for a few months. And then I just dried up the supply. I, I couldn't use it anymore. AMS ads to Dean Koontz are very up and down for me. They don't work so well in the US, but for whatever reason, they work great in the UK and they work great in Australia. So I don't quite understand that, but <laughs> I just follow the numbers. If it works, it works. And if it doesn't, I turn it off. Yeah. And it's the other question, you mentioned that you work four hours a day now. You said that, right? I mean, is that just your writing or is that the writing and the marketing? It's the writing and the whole business itself. So actually, I probably do a lot more than four hours in terms of getting myself prepared for writing. But I say it's about four hours in terms of there's like an hour and a half of writing, 
There is another 45 minutes or so of editing, reading over my manuscript. By the way, that's a Dean Kuhn's trick as well. I read that trick in an, in an interview that he wrote where he likes to rework his prose on the same day that he writes so that when he's done at the end of the day, that chapter is done. It's ready for his editor. Now, I don't send it to my editor, but there's a power. There's a power in finishing the day knowing that up to that point in my book, my book is done. I don't need to deal with it again. So, you know, people slog through second, third, fourth drafts after the fact. I never do. It's just done. So that's another 45 minutes. Um, well, I'll just get in my daily routine, which mm -hmm. now this starts to get a little bit above the fold here, but I think it's really important. You know, everybody asks me about advertising and is that the secret to my success? Is it rapid release? Because I'm releasing a book every few months and I'm about to release them even more frequently. And the answers are kind of and kind of, but there's a lot more that I do. So much of this is mindset, Joanna. Mm. Uh, it, it really is. I mean, and anybody can change their mindset with a snap of the finger if they really want to. It's a lot of just forming better habits and finding what works with you. I came from a broken home. My, my father left our family when I was four years old. And that probably is one of my earliest memories is my father sitting me down at the kitchen table and saying, I'm moving in with grandma and grandpa. And after that, my father became a, a rather famous person in performing arts. And I almost never saw him again after that. Um, it was a very frustrating life growing up. My mother had her own demons. We lived with a man who became physically abusive to us. And those were things which I ended up dealing with you know, growing up my entire life. And I bottled them up and I hid them from people. And I didn't tell anybody about what my issues were. And it just exploded on me. Finally, when I got into college, I, I basically had, I wouldn't call it quite a mental breakdown, but I, I, all of a sudden I had all this social anxiety. I couldn't go out without feeling sick to my stomach. I was just hiding from people in general and I needed therapy. And, and once I started getting therapy, I started to get better. But once I, I moved out of my mother's house and I started to do things for my own, and I'm not saying my mother was toxic. I was just saying that I needed to start doing things for myself in building that confidence. And that's probably the first time in my life where I, I felt this, this super energy kind of pulsing through me. I wouldn't tap it for years and years later, but it was the first sign that I could break out of this on my own. It was just a matter of changing my mindset. So, yeah, I mean, I, I meet writers all the time and tell me I can't, I just, I can't keep up with the writing because I have a job. And then I have to explain to them that I did this from 2014 to 2021, writing an hour or more per day while holding up a full-time job. Well, yeah, but I have kids. Well, so did I. Well, yeah, but I wanted to go to the gym. Well, yeah, so did I. And I did all these things too. You can fit it into your life if you really want to, if it really means that much to you. So now my life is, is a lot more high energy because of the way that I treat my body by feeding it proper nutrition, by exercising every day or almost every day. And some of that exercise is pretty strenuous. So I'm always kind of feeding my mind. I'm making it ready to write. And also because writing is so difficult, every author knows how facing that blank page every day could be so challenging. So you have to have this positive mindset. You have to have high energy. There are all sorts of tips, which the self-help industry, the self-development gurus will espouse things like manifesting, all that different stuff. And you know what? It all works, but it all works for different reasons, depending on what you believe. Some people believe that manifesting works because they believe in a uh, higher power. They believe in God and they think that they're talking to God and God is helping them. Other people are spiritual in the sense that they think the universe is giving it to them. Other people look at it as uh, this is the subconscious mind that you're feeding positive thoughts to. So here's something which you know a lot of people don't realize. Your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between a truth statement and a lie. Whatever you tell your subconscious mind, if you tell it enough times, it will believe it. So if you tell yourself over and over again that you are a great writer and that you're going to make X amount of money from it, you can become that, or at least your subconscious mind will certainly believe it. 
Now, where does it go from there? So, okay, so you've planted the thoughts in your subconscious mind. Let's say that you want to buy a bungalow house. How does this end up actually manifesting to the point where you can buy a bungalow house? Well, once you have decided you want to buy a bungalow house, every time you go out and drive around, you're going to recognize bungalows, which are off to the side of the road. And so you finally see one which is for sale, or you're going to be checking online and it's, or somebody's going to be talking about, hey, I just saw this great bungalow go up for sale. And immediately you're going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah. So what you're actually doing is you're priming your subconscious to look for these opportunities. And so that's what I'm doing every day is I'm trying to prime my mind to look for opportunities to write well, to find new ways to promote myself, to make a larger profit or a larger revenue stream. And how do I set my energy to high every day? You know, what I do is probably going to be different than what you would do do, or anybody who's listening will do. But you need to find the things that put you in a positive mindset. For me, I wake up in the morning and before I do anything, I open up a book, which is something which is, is really positive. So it's not a Jack Ketchum book. I'll read that a little <laughs> bit later in the day. So it's probably something like a self-development book, maybe some Tony Robbins or some Brendan Burchard or somebody like that. And I'll just read it for about five to seven minutes. So, all right, now I've got a better mindset. So I'll take care of tasks before I do anything, before I write, before I get on with my day, then I will sit down and I will spend at least five to 10 minutes on goal planning. So what are my long-term goals? What am I trying to do to get to a point where I want to be in 12 months from now? So right now I'm working on some goals, which are financial, some goals, which are writing-based and some goals which are just for me personally and who I want to be as a person. But then I also uh, learned about these monthly goals, and this was a Brendan Burchard trick, where it, you can't always be looking long-term. How about giving you so, yourself some, some near-term victories so that you have something to charge yourself up with every single day? So that is where we came up with the concept of monthly goals. So now I have this monthly revenue goal, which I'm trying to hit in KDP. And I'm hoping that I will get there, but more than hoping I'm coming up with a plan and whether I do or don't, I'm really focused on it, but here's where it, it works and we're thinking about it kind of manifests the reality. So here I am trying to come up with this monthly revenue goal and I'm trying to figure out, well, I don't have a release again until the beginning of December. So it's not going to come from a release. Don't I already have enough ads running out there? What am I going to do? So I'm like, just for the heck of it, I'm going through my ads this morning and I, I, I look far less commonly at my Australian ads than I, uh, in my um, Canadian ads than I do my American ones because I make so much money in America. Hmm. And I'm looking at my Australian AMS dashboard and I'm seeing that, my goodness, I'm making money hand over fist over there. Every target which I put up just seems to work. My ACOS is, is so low and my CPC is just so low compared to in the amount of books which I'm selling over there. So now all of a sudden it just hits me that if I just spend a day and come up with more keywords and more targets in that country, I'm going to suddenly sell a lot more books there. And this may be the path, or at least it's going to get me to a lot closer to the goal, which I'm trying to set for me this month. So always keep these, these things in mind. Whatever it is that you want to do, write it down. Even if you write it down digitally, like in a Google Doc, write it down, look at it frequently, brainstorm ways to come up with the answer. And you'll find a lot of times it just, it just happens. It just comes to you. Wow. Great talk there. Great pep talk for everyone. <laughs> I think, you know, I, no, and I love that. And I know you've got stuff on your blog about mindset as well. And, but it's interesting because you had uh, a good mindset back when you wrote horror, but what you then did was take action on this isn't working, which is what I admire very much about you and people who make this pivot. I think it's a very, it's a strong move because it's difficult to let let go of some of those old series. I mean, I feel this very much, but I have multiple streams of income in other ways. But I, I am often thinking about this, like maybe I should write something else. But you do have to do the research and, as you say, the mindsets. So just returning to the four hours a day, I don't think people are believing you because you're basically saying that you 
do 90 minutes writing, 45 minutes editing, like you mentioned some the mindset stuff you do and the preparing. And then so realistically, you're saying you really only spend an, what, an hour a day on marketing? I mean, there's there's marketing and there's also like just coming up very simple things like making sure that I have a social media post every single day, something that will at least either make my Facebook and Instagram readers laugh or I'm trying to promote like a book or something. And I have like a ratio in the back of my mind that I always keep too, that I, I try to entertain my my uh, followers a lot more than I sell to them. But every month though, I, I'm always kind of at least once I'm hitting, hey, sign up for my, my, my mailing list. Hey, I've got this new book coming up. So yeah, I, th- that's part of the planning. But yeah, th- I'll do a lot more with market, marketing and goal setting kind of for me anyway, goes hand in hand. So like I'll I'll be working on goal setting and then I'll be like, oh yeah, that idea about Australia, I'm going to go work on that. And so now instead of like spending 15 minutes on marketing and just kind of tweaking the CPCs on on my bids, now I'm like coming up with all these new ideas and I'm I'm into it all day. But yeah, it ends up being about four hours once I've done marketing and social media, writing, editing. And also uh, there is another 15 or 20 minutes, which is added into that as well, which is planning. I'm always planning story beats for my next book so that as soon as I finish this book, the story beats are set, set to go for the next book and I don't have to lose a day. I don't have to lose a week coming up with a new story. Boom, I could just go again. So mm-hmm. A lot of that is efficiency too. I'm planning into my day to make sure that I'm always writing every day. I'm always coming up with a new book. And my goal is to release a new book every four to five weeks in in the year 2023. And right now, at least on my writing anyway, I'm I'm on pace to do that, but I need to do it for another seven, eight months to, to bring it to fruition. Again, it's part of my work day and is always thinking of, of new ways to get ahead and stay ahead uh, and planning for the inevitable setbacks. There's always going to be a setback, so try to stay ahead of the game. Fantastic. Oh, you've shared so much. And I mean, obviously, people listening, some of them might be interested in your fiction, but I think a lot more of them are interested in more of your tips. <laughs> and you do have some <laughs> blog posts, but you also share quite a lot in the 20 books to 50K group. Is that right? Yeah, I do. Not as much as I used to, just because I've found social media to be just so, it's a time suck and it can be kind of soul draining at times. To be honest with you, the worst place on earth, I think, is Twitter. There's just so many hateful things that get said on Twitter. But for me, it's the best place on earth because it's the one that you can aggregate. If you just follow the people or you just create lists out of the people that you want to read. So for instance, you know, I have a, a list of, of writers and entrepreneurs who I, who I absolutely adore and I treasure their opinions. You know, you're one of them. I have you on a list and other people on that list. And that's what I see when I, when I bring up a third party app, like a tweet deck, I just see that that feed. And then I have a feed of people who are, are motivational types like the Eric Thomases and the T- and Tony Robbins and the Brendan Burchards and people like that. So I always have this positivity he- heading at me. And if, if anybody like were to, nobody on that list would, but if anybody on that list were to say something hateful, then I would just take them off the list. So all those, all that bullying or racism or sexism that you hear about going on on Twitter, I never see it. And it's wonderful. But on Facebook, I do see it. I see it a lot. Mm-hmm. And I just, I find it to be very soul draining. And it makes me want to like fight back and say, no, no, don't say this. But, you know, that's a waste of my time because you can't change anybody's opinion on social media anyway. But I just don't want to see it. So with Facebook, I'm almost never in my public profile anymore. I'm almost always in my author profile and just like talking to my author or my readers and making sure that they know what's coming up and just keeping them entertained. Otherwise, I'm hardly ever on Facebook at all. Same thing with Instagram. I'll show up and I'll make a post and then I'll talk to the readers who I have on Instagram and respond to them. But otherwise, I'm not like scrolling through Instagram and seeing what other people are doing because I always run into something which is hateful eventually if I keep scrolling or just something which is just going to waste my time. And if you want to be serious about, uh, well, any business endeavor and certainly with in writing, you have to say no to things. 
And it doesn't have to be social media for you, but it is for me. Mm, Absolutely. So where can people find you and your books online? So I recommend that people go to my website at danpedavana.com and that's spelled uh, P-A-D-A-V-O-N-A. And if you go to my website, you'll not only find my books, but you'll also find uh, some advice for reader reader articles, which I'm always adding to. And I'm throwing around the idea, you know, I'd really love to do a podcast to to help other writers and just something quick that I can put out like once every week or two and just kind of help people with little tips like I shared here today. And so be looking for that too. I'll make an announcement when I have a a launch date in, in sight. Fantastic. Well, yeah, definitely let me know because I'm interested for sure. So thanks so much for your time, Dan. That was great. Wonderful, Joanna. Thank you very much. So I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Dan and that his thoughts on positive mindset, habits and pivoting for success help you as you plan for 2023. And he has indeed started his his uh, podcast on author mindset. So you can find that uh, links to that at his website. So coming up this week, I have a discussion with Charlene Putney, who is a writer and co-creator of Leica, which is, you guessed it, a generative AI writing tool. But the different spin on this one is the ability to train different brains, including training a brain, in inverted commas, in on your own work. So I've tried this a number of times this year, and it's really interesting to see what Charlene and her business partner are doing. Plus, they want to create a licensing model, a bit like the one I postulated in my 2020 book on AI. So I was thrilled to hear her talk about that, um, which is essentially I've said, and I've said this before on the show is that I would love to say with a whole load of indie thriller writers and they're indie because you have to own your rights to your IP in order to be part of this kind of thing but to say okay if you want to train an action adventure brain you could license this group of authors as a brain and then that will help you write your own so I think that's a really interesting idea and that is coming in in between episode then next Monday I have an interview with first-time author Barnaby Jameson who is a barrister here in the UK a king's council and if you're not in the UK uh, you wouldn't know but this is a very big deal he specializes in anti-terrorism and he just released his first historical novel. He is very well connected in the literary world and could have done a traditional publishing deal, but he decided to go indie and do it with style. Barnaby talks about what he learned and what he will do better next time because he's going to continue going the indie route. Uh, He talks about what he spent money on and what was worth doing. And I know you'll enjoy listening because he also has a really lovely British accent. So that's coming up next week. And in the meantime, if you are listening in 2022, you can get 33% off my ebooks and audiobooks and my courses. Just use coupon 2022 on creativepenbooks.com for ebooks and audiobooks and 2022 on the creativepen.com forward slash learn for my courses. Links in the show notes as ever. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.